So let's go to the Lord. Well, Father, I thank you so much for this church, for the men and women who've been faithful to be hungry and to grow and to prevail and endure through all the different adversities and difficulties that we faced over 45, 50 years, Father. It's just been a, it's been the source of, of my life. It has been the source of my life with God, and I'm just grateful for it. For those that have put themselves out, and those who are still here, ready to fight a spiritual war. Let us not be just hearers, Father, just fat babies hearing, but let us be doers. Let us understand the times in which we live and be able to interpret this, the history that we're living out as we speak and know how to apply the Word of God to it to be, to be safe and to be secure within ourselves, but also to have great impact on those around us for Christ. And that's what this lesson today is about, Father. And so we ask you to bless us in Christ's name. Amen. Now you're going to need your Bibles and you're going to need to open to Romans chapter 1. This is going to be sticking your head in there. And uh, this is a magnificent discussion that Paul writes in this book. It's written at least partially to the Jews. It's full of clarification about the Jews. But one of the things that the chapter, first chapter talks about is how God has revealed himself to the creation to all people through the creation so i want to look at romans 1 16 through i guess through 18 17 to talk about the first thing these two things god revealed the first is the gospel reveals his righteousness and this is going to be imputed and then the wrath of god is also revealed and we'll talk about that for i'm not ashamed of the gospel so, listen, are you ashamed to speak up in public, standing at a lunch counter or in the grocery line? I mean, are you afraid? Are you ashamed of that? Grow out of that. There's no, there's no, there's no holding back. I mean, we're, we're wide open in the angelic conflict. It's time to speak up. You guys are way, way mature enough to be able to be courageous and go, I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to tell them what they need to hear. Just an encouragement. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes it. To the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. Or excuse me, to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. In other words, from faith at salvation to faith in living the Christian life. And then you got the third, which is going to heaven. So, from faith to faith. For the wrath of God is also revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So, what does that mean? First of all, the gospel explains the exchange. This passage is full of exchanges. And one of the things that is, that is exchanged is that the moment you trust in Christ, your sins are put on Him in the courtroom, and His righteousness is put on you. You exchange your unrighteousness for His righteousness. And that's what the gospel reveals. It reveals the imputed righteousness. Now, if I was a legalist, I would say the gospel reveals the moral code that you should live by as a Christian. But that's, a, that's, a mis, that's misfounded. That's not correct. The righteousness in view here is the imputed righteousness, the sharing of His righteousness in Christ. So, the gospel explains the exchange of minus R of the lost whose sins have already been paid in full with the imputation of righteousness plus R of Christ when we believe the gospel. So, I mean, listen, is there a better thing that you've learned than that? I mean, you need to go, well, you know, that doesn't help me in my marriage. That doesn't help me at job, my job. Well, I mean, it does, but that's the biggest thing. That's the foundation. And listen, we got to understand. 
Whatever you think about America and the time in which we live, what's the real issue for us as ministers of, of Jesus Christ is helping people be saved. Now, I'm all about the Christian life. My whole focus in ministry is about how to walk this out. I don't spend a lot of time on the positionals or the, but look, that's, that's where we are with the people around us. In my opinion, that's where you should be focused. How can I give the gospel? This ministry of submission that I taught a few weeks back, that's a marvelous opportunity to show when, when you're attacked, when, when, you're, when you're attacked by unjust or unfair government or your employer or in your marriage or in an institution, your radical humility to trust yourself to God rather than standing up for yourself. Now, I'm not saying you don't, there's not a time to stand up. I'm not saying be beat up or run over. I'm just saying that there's a time, a ministry, where you show your surrender to the Lord, and through that, it's a light, it's a blinding light to people who are being used to persecute you. They're just pawns. We're not, we're not fighting flesh and blood. They're being used. All these people in the government, these famous people who are being used to destroy America, they're pawns. It's not about them. It's about the evil forces behind them, indwelling them. And we're just the point of attack. But listen, God has a counterattack. I'm teaching that tonight, Sunday night, if you're interested in that. God has a counterattack. And it's the ministry, what I call the ministry of submission, where somebody is induced to come to your door and, you know, arrest you or persecute you or push you around, you know, sent by the government to do that. And then you can, they're an unbeliever. You go, what do I do about that? I mean, do I get my guns out and go down in a blaze of glory? Well, you can. Go ahead. If that won't get anybody saved. That won't accumulate any spiritual points for you, in my opinion. But what you can do is trust yourself totally to God and give yourself into that and embrace that situation by embracing the soul, the heart and soul of the human being being used to put this upon, perpetrate this on you. They're not. They, you say, well, there is evil, so they bought into it. So they're, they're deceived. Our job is to help bring them back to the line so they can step it over it for God. Now, here's, I say it's your job. It's your opportunity. If you say, well, I'm just too selfish for that. I, I'm just going to stand. Look, I'm, okay. Okay. I mean, I don't think, I think it's a volunteer program. Whether you're willing to be that submissive to God, that surrendered that you, he, he can use you to do anything, even be a martyr. See, this is our example. Now, we say, I say all that to get, because we're headed for God's wrath. So the righteousness of Christ imputed is in the gospel, but the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So we're, we're going to talk about what the wrath of God, what I think the wrath of God is. Uh, but first, what does this mean to suppress? How do you suppress the truth in unrighteousness? First of all, this word means to hold back or to hinder. All right, so what I think happens is the person hears the gospel maybe a number of times and they reject it. They say, no, 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 they won't go over the line. And then what happens, they suppress. See, the gospel is not just another theory that, you know, you can take or leave. The gospel says if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection, you're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. Right? That's, that's, uh, that's it. That's as, much, as confrontational as you can be with any human being. That's not something you can just go, oh, yeah, whatever. That sticks in your craw. And when you reject it, 
what happens is that you suppress that back into your subconscious so that you don't have to think about it. You just stick it back there, like the fear of death. The Bible says you're dominated, that people are dominated by the fear of death. You know how you know that? They don't want to talk about it. You say, well, what about what do you think about dying? Let's not talk about dying. Why not? Why not? It's, a, it's the best door you're ever going to go through. Tell me a better door than that. Of course, it would mess up your schedule. Uh, but so they suppress it back into their subconscious where it becomes a source of guilt and fear. You understand? Just in the back of your mind. So these people get a little older. Or maybe they have a health problem and that thing's in the back of your mind giving guilt and fear out, cranking out guilt and fear. Fear, fear. It's so low. That voice is so low you almost can't hear it, but there it is. It stays there. That's what the gospel does. It convicts. Convicts you. So they have to suppress it because they don't want to deal with it. So, the gospel is rejected and then suppressed into the subconscious as an unbelieved theory where it remains as an indictment, a source of guilt and fear that they refuse to face. Having rejected and suppressed the gospel, the unbeliever refuses to consciously confront it, confront their own wrong thinking so that fear from condemnation that they know becomes anger toward God. He refuses to work with our plans. See, you say, I don't want to go to hell, but I also don't want to do things God's way. Well, you got to choose one or the other. And so what people do when they do this suppression thing, they come to a point where they, they blame God because God has His own standards. And they want God to give in to their standards. So, all right. What is God's wrath? God's wrath is, this term is what's called an anthropopathism. So here, here's, uh, here's God up in heaven with, you know, oh wait, we're, uh, where's my eraser? Never mind. Here's God up in heaven. We're talking about wrath. So we've got to do that one. And wrath says smoke's coming out of his ears, right? Arr. Is that God? Something that you did got God so upset that smoke started coming out of his ears. Now who here has studied the essence of God? The essence box, right? Is there anywhere in that in sovereignty, immutability, omniscience, omnipotence, and justice, and righteousness? Is there anywhere where you see a person with smoke coming out their ears? Okay, so let's, let's clarify. In a real way, God doesn't get mad. He's not a person that gets mad because of us. He's above that. When it talks about God's wrath, it's talking about God's policy and the results of that policy when we go against God. What happens when you go against God? Is it good? No. No. It might feel good, but it, just for a little while. So, anything that goes against God's person, revelation, or boundary is, starts to create a problem immediately. I think what wrath is, rather than God whooping on people, is the is the is the creation of that principle that says the moment I move away from God, even the slightest bit of surrendering, of being surrendered to His will, a process begins in my life that moves me away from Him. It's a process of degenerating away from this sweet place of fellowship with God. I get worried again. I start trying to handle it myself again. You know, I get angry with people again. I get frustrated with people in my life again instead of being relaxed and patient. And it gets worse and worse. And the farther you, listen, the more you refuse to come back, confess all that, 
deal with the root causes of all that, and you refuse to come back, and you're over here in this tangent, you're out on this wild dirt road, well, you're going to suffer out there. This is as a believer. Now, as an unbeliever, see, the believer, believer doesn't deal with wrath. There's no wrath for the believer. It's already handled. Wrath was handled on the cross. Got it? No wrath for you. But this principle of moving away from God and the, and the consequences is called choices and what? Remember what we taught the kids? You don't remember, do you? Choices and C word. Consequences. Thank you. Imagine the unbeliever. Here's the gospel. Death, burial, resurrection. And they hear it once. They hear it twice. They hear it third time. And they reject it, reject it, reject it. This passage says when that happens that there's a part of them that opens up and begins to, to draw in evil. It's, a, it's taught in the passive voice. You, the, 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 believer, this part, the son believer doesn't do it. It's done to them. When they reject God, His revelation, this mateotes opens up and begins to suck in all of the evil thinking in the world. You just become a vacuum. In fact, the word mateotes indicates a vacuum. And so, but anyway, what happens from there is that you suck in all this evil and you begin to live this evil lifestyle and then you hook up with all these other evil lifestyle folks and this becomes your life and you move farther and farther and farther away from trusting the gospel of Jesus Christ to end up with God. You know, every soul's on a trajectory. That's what the word sin means. It means to miss the target. You're on a trajectory. Christ is, on, is dead on the perfect target of God, of truth, of righteousness. You're in Christ, you're on a perfect target. But without Christ, without Christ, see, here's Christ, perfect righteous target. He's on a perfect trajectory. We were not, we were going all over the place, but then we trusted and we're placed into union with Him, so we share His, what, destiny. Right? That's the word destiny means you're on target. So, but all these people who refuse to connect with him and hit and therefore hit the target, where, where are they going to hit? What's going to happen when they go through this life, step into eternity? Where are they going to be? God's going to collect them all up. And he's going to put them in a place, heart of the earth, and then another place called the lake of fire. Because you missed the target. Now, that's the wrath of God. In my opinion, now I know that God does things. He sends the angels to gather people up and in the tribulation and all the things that go on. I'm not saying God doesn't act. What I'm saying is that the principle is you create your own wrath by your choices. The principle is you move away from God any amount and, and degeneracy begins. It begins, it's just a natural principle. It's just like if you move your plant out of the sun, what happens to it? it? Begins to die. Right? Same idea. You move away from God, you begin to die. You begin to degenerate. You begin to come apart. That's called entropy. But, all right. That's what I think the wrath of God is. And, and there's, it's, it's given to us in the Scripture in all of these pictorial ways these images, these metaphors, so that we can relate to it. Now, that's what a, an anthropopathism describes God in human terms so that we can relate to Him, but what we're really relating to are His policies, His principles, the things that He lives by. I see the wrath of God as the consequences that He's programmed into the universe so that anyone who moves away from Him begins to degenerate. It's just that simple. I mean, it's not, it's not that God's up there waiting on you to mess up and go, okay, I got you now. No, you mess up and it begins, it just happens. All right, so 
An anthropopathism describes God uh, with human thinking, emotion, reaction. An anthropomorphism means gives God in human form. And, but God doesn't actually possess these characteristics, but they're given to us in that way so we can relate personally to His policies. We ascribe to God human attributes that He doesn't possess to understand His policies. The wrath is God's design of the universe regarding all that opposes His will. Anything that opposes His will or moves away from His will begins to die. Silly, simple as that. So when it says God's wrath is revealed, how does that apply to, to human beings today? That should apply so that these people realize in their personal life that they have moved away from Christ more and more into evil thinking, and they should see the results of that in their life. They should see the results in their life. I mean, their life's a mess. Their life's painful. Their life's hurtful. Their life is sad. And they don't have any hope of ever getting it right. Well, what a way to live. Do you know how <laughs> wonderful what you've been given is? How it gives you an optimism about your life, even when you're down. It says, we're, we're, we, get to, we win in the end. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, Romans chapter 1, starting at 16 through 32, uh, is, a, is, a, is a picture of when any person or culture rejects God's revelation of himself, of his existence or then rejects the gospel message. This is the, the image of himself is taught through nature and through your conscience. When anybody does that, a terrible process of ever-increasing degeneration begins to corrupt the belief system of that person, leading to stages of mental corruption. I mean, just silly thinking. I mean, just wrong thinking. Foolishness. You do foolish things. You know, you, you, you manage your life in a foolish way. You deal with your marriage in a foolish way. You treat your kids. Just, it's just because you've, you've, you've moved away from God. You've moved away from His will. You're no longer relaxed. You're no longer surrendered in letting the Spirit guide you into how to live your life. You're over here on your own, doing your own thing because you've got something that you didn't think God would give you something you want that you're over here after, success or approbation or admiration or, you know, an easy lifestyle, whatever it is you're pursuing, how about romantic love? How many mistakes have people made in their life pursuing romantic love? You know, we wouldn't have poets if that weren't the case. Now, this is a continually worsening mental spiraling down into the corruption and it begins to be expressed by idolatry. Unrestrained sexuality, every form of sin, and the evil that grows worse and worse all along the way until God has to wipe it out. It's a process. When that exodus went into the land, what did God tell him to do with all the people there? Why? He said, lest they tempt you into participating in the evil things that they are practicing. See, this homosexuality, I got into this through Sodom and Gomorrah. Did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality? My answer is no. That that was just part, one part of their degenerating the results of degeneration, they rejected God way back here, and now they're at this place of degeneration where homosexuality is just one category. So, and listen, that's what's happening in America right now. If this, proceed, if this continues here, they're going to normalize uh, pedophilia, bestiality, uh, anything, necrophilia. This is gonna, they're going to be people that practice this uh, legally. And anybody that says differently is going to be a hater. So, that's really going to change up the funeral home business, I think. Uh, I know, that was just a really poor attempt at humor. But uh, So, 
In the following passage, Romans 1, 18 through 32, we're going to see five categories, if I ever get there. I don't think I will, but of, cons- of choices, consequences, and results. So just let me walk through them with you. If you'll go to the second page. First of all, God reveals Himself. All right, and He uses nature and He uses your conscience. The fact that you have a conscience and you have a sense of right and wrong, we many believe is, is part of the image and likeness of God inside of you. And so God reveals Himself through the stars. You know, the stars show the glory of God and all this and the divine nature. He's going to tell us in here that the creation itself shows God's invisible essence, His eternal power and divine nature. You can see that through nature and through conscience. Secondly, that revelation is rejected. When people see God through nature, their conscience, and then they reject God. This is when the trouble starts. And listen, the principle applies to you. What is it in your life that you know is God's will? I mean, you know it. Yet you're committed to doing something else. What is that? What's more important than that inner peace and joy and relaxed soul, this this tranquil, tranquil soul, and, and listen, the impact on all the ones you love, what's more than important than that in your life? You're, so you're rejecting the Word of God. So when you reject the revelation, you refuse to believe, and you suppress the truth. We talked about that. When you do this mateotes, the mateotoo opens up, and, and the subconscious begins to draw in all kinds of See, you, re, you shut down on God, but you got to be ta- you taking in something. So if you shut down on God, you come here and, you know, John was talking downstairs about being uh, uh, an eater that doesn't produce. Well, you know, you can just come here and sit at the table and not even really eat. But you've shown yourself and you're, you're still one of the faithful, but you're not listening anymore. You quit listening a while back. None of this is really pertinent to your daily life. It's just knowledge. It's just information. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that. Well, I mean, you've just lost all the sharpness that comes from walking in the Holy Spirit so that when you hear these things taught, it clicks for you. It, the bell goes off and you go, okay, I see what you're pointing out in my life. And then you go and correct it. Or you walk out on it. You, you step over the cliff on it. You do what God is calling you to do. Trusting Him. So, don't reject the, the revealed will of God in your life. But this is what happens. You reject, reject the person of God and this evil, this, this uh, valve opens and you suck in evil. Um, he says... Oh, for even though they knew, this is verse 21, even though they knew God, see, they had an under, they, they could see this. They did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him as God, but they became futile. That's Mateotis. They opened up this emptiness in their, in their thinking, and their foolish heart was filled with darkness. That's evil thinking. Professing to be wise, oh, well, they're really smart ones. They became fools. And they, listen, God exchanged unrighteousness for righteousness so you could be saved. But what, look what they do. They exchange, they, uh, they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God, imperishable God, His perfection forever, for an image in the form of corruptible man, of birds, of, of animals, and crawling creatures. So what is that? That's called idolatry. It's called the golden calf. Instead of sticking with God, taking this revelation in from God and going, oh gosh, there's a God. I believe there's a God. Well, how do we get in contact with Him? It's called the gospel. And I believe the gospel, and I'm saved. But you say no to that, and you say no to the gospel, and here you are. You end up taking in foolish, silly stuff. Who in the world would think that bowing down to a, uh, a stone 
would somehow change the dynamics of your world. Where does that come from? That's called superstition. But finally, once you get into this place of rejecting God and His revelation and you take in all this evil, you exchange God. See, he says also said, they exchanged the glory of God for these, these uh, idols. 24, therefore God gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity that their bodies might be dishonored among them. This is just regular sinfulness, adultery, you know, fornication. And here, watch again. For they exchanged, see that? They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And what did they do with that? They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Now here's where we're going to get into the really good stuff of all kinds of passions and all kinds of desires attached to all kinds of crazy things. The women exchange. See the word exchanged again? The natural function for that which is unnatural. And the men did the same thing. And just as they not see fit in verse 28, to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do the things which are not proper. And he goes on to describe his total depravity, murder, envy, and all this stuff. So, this is where America is. I didn't say all that to discourage you or accuse you. I'm, I'm using it in my life as a motivation to say I need to get back to the gospel. And I need to keep my eyes and ears open and I need to be aggressive in my life with the people around me and the people that I meet, you know, at the grocery store and at the automotive center or whatever, you know, and ask them, you know, hey, are you a Christian? They go, yeah, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I say, well, if you don't mind me asking you, and I try to do it in a nice way, I don't slap them and grab them and stuff, but I say, what do you think a person has to do to go to heaven? And then, of course, they've got an answer. You know, be baptized or be nice to people or whatever. And so that gives me, when they tell me what they think, now that I have a chance to tell them what I think. And I just explain the death, burial, and resurrection. If they believe it, God will give them eternal life. Easy as pie. I'm starting to do that with everybody. Why would I not? Why would I not do that with every soul that I meet? Well, you're being nuisance. So... Nuisance to who? God? Do you think God take that as a nuisance? How about the unbeliever that actually believes that and gets saved? Do you think it's a nuisance to them? I don't think so. Father, thank you for this opportunity to speak and share the things that I'm learning, the things that are going in my soul. I thank you for old friends who've come today and just reminding me how much I love them and how much I've missed them. And, uh, and, and how much I hope that we can reconnect. And as all of this adversity comes upon us in America, and it certainly is, that we could join together, Father, and be a team and be to support each other and pray for each other, take care of each other. That's what this church, hope we come to that, Father. I hope we, hope we come closer and closer to that, that we might serve one another's needs in, in doing so, Show the world what the grace of God is. I love you, Father. I praise you in Christ's name. Amen.